so I'm going to read for you this part of a script of one of the best movies of all time. Uh, Princess Bride, I think most people would agree, it's fantastic, right? It's, it's got sword fighting, it's got action, it's got true love, and it's wonderful. And kissing, as we know, because the little boy does not like the kissing scenes at the beginning. So I'm going to read from you a section as Wesley and Buttercup are walking through the fire swamp, and they've got the popping fire coming up, and they're having to avoid that. Wesley, of course, as casual as can be, just, oh yes, let me just move you aside. But he's talking about how he went from being the farm boy to the Dread Pirate Roberts. So I'm going to read you that section as he talks about it. He says this, You see, what I told you before about saying please was true. It intrigued Roberts, as did my description of your beauty. Finally, Roberts decided something. He said, All right, Wesley, I've never had a valet. You can try it for tonight. I'll most likely kill you in the morning. Three years he said that. Good night, Wesley. Good work. Sleep well. I'll most likely kill you in the morning. It was a fine time for me. I was learning to fence, to fight, anything anyone would teach me. And Roberts and I eventually became friends. And then it happened. What? Go on, says Buttercup. Ooh, this is important. Wesley picks her up, carrying her across the swamp water that is bridged by a narrow, rickety tree branch. Very important. Wesley, well, Roberts had grown so rich, he wanted to retire. So he took me to his cabin, and he told me the secret. I am not the Dread Pirate Roberts, he said. My name is Ryan. I inherited this ship from the previous Dread Pirate Roberts, just as you will inherit it from me. The man I inherited it from is not the real Dread Pirate Roberts either. His name was Cumberbund. The real Roberts has been retired 15 years and living like a king in Patagonia. Then he explained the name was the important thing for the inspiring the necessary fear. You see, no one would surrender to the Dread Pirate Wesley. The two of them now have crossed the pond. So we sailed ashore, took on an entirely new crew, and he stayed aboard a for a while as first mate all the time calling me Roberts. Once the crew believed, he left the ship, and I have been Roberts ever since. Except now that we're together, I shall retire and hand the name over to someone else. Is that clear to you? And as anyone knows, Buttercup then falls into the lightning sand. It's great. And he has to dive after. And why in the world are we talking about this? Wesley had a lot to go through from being the poor farm boy to becoming this great dreaded pirate Roberts. And he briefly describes his time for three years of waking up not knowing if he was going to be killed that day, of learning to sword fight, of learning to fight and do whatever was asked of him from the crew. He had to go through trials and trials and learning and growing, not knowing what was going to happen. He didn't know if he would one day get off the ship and find his true love, except for true love is the greatest thing in the world, according to this movie. But... He didn't know. He had to go through these trials to get from one point to the other, not knowing what was going to happen in between, and eventually he comes out and becomes the Dread Pirate Roberts. And he, he becomes rich and has power and all these things. But during that time, it was hard. He couldn't see what was coming. He didn't know. The trial was not easy. As for us, I think you would all agree, are trials easy? No, it, it's hard when we go through hard things we don't want to. And so, and you know, there, there are hard days, there are hard weeks, there are hard months, and sometimes even hard years. We don't always know the end. We don't know what's going to happen. But what we're going to talk about today is that we can find hope in these trials. Even if it's the hope of looking to when it's over and looking back and seeing what God has done. But before we get into that, I want to talk about the problem with trials. So there's a lot of problems that cause us as humans not to like them, right? We uh, are not infinite beings. We want to be happy all the time. We don't want hard things to happen. We are not patient and all these things. There are so many things just simply as being human that we just want to fight. Every part of our human nature says, no, I don't want to go through this hard thing. I want life to be easy. So the first thing is that we are finite beings. To be finite means having a definite or definable limits, having a limited nature or existence. We have this unfortunate problem of ours that we can't see all of time. We can't see the future, we can't even see the past except for what's been shown to us, and we can't see five minutes from now what's going to happen. 
you guys don't know what I'm going to say in five minutes, so watch out. But we are, in, or we are finite. We also can't see at the end of the road the things that will have changed us. We're stuck right here, right now, thinking, oh, what do we do? What comes next? But God, the God that we love, the God that we worship, he's infinite. Right? We, we believe in a God that has no beginning and no end and can see every part of time at every moment, and he knows your ending. He knows the ending to the current struggle or trial that you might be going through right now, and the next one, and the one you don't even know about that's coming. He knows the ultimate ending that will bring us all to eternal life with him, which is going to be great. He sees it all. But we as humans say, oh, I'm finite. I want to know. We want to control things, but we can't. So there's problem number one is that we are simply a finite being. Uh, Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. We try to make these plans because we know what's going to happen, and he says, nope, I got better thoughts. I got different plans. I'm going to take you over here because I know what's going on. You don't. And we have to learn to give that up to him. I mean, I think you all know one of the men in the Bible who had some real struggles with trials was Job, right? I mean, he's doing great, awesome, and God's so proud of him. He says to Satan, hey, Satan, have you looked at my friend Job? Have you looked at my servant? He's righteous. He's going to do great. I mean, I hope God can say that of me, but at the same time, that's a little terrifying. That if God's having a conversation with Satan and says, oh, you should go attack that guy over there. Oh, thanks, God. That's awesome. But Job goes through all these trials and loses his house, his family, his friends, and even his wife is like, hey, curse God and die. And eventually Job comes to a point where he's talking with God, and I love it because God just gives him the, hey, uh, do you even know where I store my lightning? No? Oh, okay. Do you, have you seen where I keep the snow? No? Hmm. Were you there when I created the world? No? Okay. Like, and he just goes and he explains all of his greatness and his goodness, and Job is just and that's what we have to come to, which is not easy. Just this point of, God, you created this world. You've got it under control. And then there's the next thing I would like to bring up is a problem with happiness. Right? We, th we have this desire to be happy, yeah? to live peaceful lives. We sometimes even have this thought that we deserve to be happy or that we deserve good things, or that these things should be handed to us. But unfortunately, in Scripture, there's one thing I know I deserve. One thing I know I deserve, simply being a human, being a sinner, being a person who uh, goes against God with my sin, is that one thing I deserve is death, is hell. Everything I'm given after that is a blessing from God. Every day that I wake up and breathe, every moment that I can see still and see the beautiful colors of fall and feel the cold, brisk air and the rain. Oh, please bring the rain, God. That'd be great. I love the rain. But every moment I get to see these things and enjoy these things is nothing I deserve. Nothing I'm given. My house, my beautiful children. We all know my children are beautiful. Yes, everybody. Oh. Next time I'll bring Emberly up here because she, her cheeks. You guys know. I know you know. I don't deserve my beautiful children. They're a blessing. They're a gift from God. God wants to give us these things. He wants to take care of us. But that doesn't mean we deserve these things or that we have to be, as the world would say, happy. But really the question is, whose happiness are we looking at? We're looking at my happiness and what my, my earthly things would want or God's happiness. Are we looking at my, okay, I'm going to be alive on this earth for this amount of time and this is what I want to do? Or are we looking at God saying, look, eternity is much greater. I've got this. You know, we could get a car, a house, 1.9 kids, 1.9 because that was the average of kids in a household last year, not two, 1.9, and a boat, maybe a dog and a goat. That'd be great. Awesome. And not that those things are bad, don't get me wrong, I've had many conversations with people about this stuff and people who have things and God is blessed and that's great. I love that God blesses us and takes care of us, but that doesn't equal my happiness. My happiness, my true joy coming from the Father who gives me blessings every day, the Father who, who died for me and takes care of me. So 
we have a problem with happiness. With those trials, they tend to take away our happiness, don't they? Sometimes it's simply like, oh, hey, we don't have enough money this month, so I can't, I can't go get my Starbucks, or I can't do this, or something happened with a car and that money we were saving to go on this nice vacation is now going over here. Those are just little trials that no one wants. We want to be able to think, yeah, I'm going to save this much money. I'm going to go on a trip. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to rest. And nope, not going to happen this time. Who knows? But those things aren't our happiness. Our God is our happiness. He has our eternal joy in mind. Then there's a problem with doubt. I think you guys, as humans, would, would agree that there are so many times where we think, mm, I don't think this is actually going to happen. I don't, I don't know, God. Like, I'm stuck in this really dark place. Are, are you actually going to get me out this time? Or, man, I, I'm, I'm sick. Will you actually take care of me? Will you actually heal me? And Satan wants us to doubt. No, for sure, he wants us to actually not even be thinking about it. Because if we say, God, you're not going to do it, we're going to stop thinking about if God could do it and asking him to do it. He wants us to doubt our God, our creator, our eternal Lord. And so often we do that, whether it be with a cold. God, heal me of this cold. You know, it's still there. Oh, darn. Well, it's not going to happen, so I'm going to stop praying for it. Or heal me of this bigger sickness, or take care of this, or this trial, this huge thing, or my sorrow, my hurt. Please take it away, God. But then it doesn't happen, so, oh, well, I'm going to stop praying for it because it didn't happen in my time. Uh, it, we're reading a book with our staff uh, called Living Water, and it's about the Holy Spirit in the church, and it's written by Chuck Smith. It's great. It's been challenging us and encouraging us. Um, but in this last chapter, uh, Chuck was restating something Peter said in Acts 3.12. He said, You men of Israel, you worship the God of Israel, who is the God of miracles, so why should you marvel at this? Peter had just healed the, the withered hand, and he's saying, like, we, we worship the God who we know is the creator, the God who has all these miracles and all these things. Why should this blow your mind? Why should you marvel at this? We should almost expect that God is going to do great and powerful things because he is the God of miracles. He is the God who created the universe. He is the God who makes the leaves change and the cold come. Sorry, I, if you haven't, can't tell, I'm super pumped for fall. But there's no reason we should ever doubt our God. I know watching a video, one of the guys said, before you doubt God, doubt your doubts. You're just like, oh, oh man. This is so easy for us to, yeah, mm, no. But instead be like, wait a second. Maybe that's just me. Maybe that's my feeling. Maybe I should get rid of that. We need to stop doubting that God can handle it. Or that he can at least get us to the next day. And then the next day. And then the next day. For however long it is. But then that comes to the next thing is, we're not patient people. I even think people who say they're patient, we could probably find something that makes you not patient. It'd be a fun challenge. Anyone here want to tell me they're patient? No. But I don't think, because human nature does not want to wait, we don't like to just be like, yeah, I'll wait a couple years for that thing. No, we want to get it now. We want to go out now. We want our instant gratification. And I know, especially for my generation and people younger than me, like, social media and our phones have actually not helped with this problem. Uh, I know I was texting someone this weekend, and they were just like, hey, you know there's a thing at the bottom where you uh, <laughs> reply. It's like, well, okay, I didn't have time. But, and that's not a problem. We were just joking back and forth. But we do sometimes expect, as soon as we send it, sometimes we sit and we look. Did they read it? Nope. Five minutes later, have they read it yet? Uh, has it even been delivered? And, and we're so impatient. We want that instant notification that, oh, they have it. Oh, you read it? And we all know it's the worst thing when you see someone's read the text and not messaged you back. How dare you? No. That's our instant gratification. It's the things that we need. We, uh, people post on Instagram and Facebook, and we, we look for that like or that comment, and it's, it drives us sometimes. But as humans, we're not patient. 
Uh, Winston Churchill said, it is a mistake to try to look too far ahead. The chain of destiny can only be grasped one link at a time. And obviously, Winston having to deal with world war and uh, taking care of England, knowing that you could only take it so far at a time, you could only do so little, so little. And this applies with our trials because so often we want it done now. The hurt that we have, we want it to end today. Oh, well, good, I expect because God is good, God is great, and he can do that. See, I'm not doubting anymore. I'm expecting him to do great, but, oh, it didn't happen this time. My patience is wearing thin and thinner and thinner. But we have to see that, again, remember, we're not infinite. We're finite. And what we think could happen in a day, God says, it's going to take a year and a half. What we think should be done in five minutes and just a simple, okay, God, I'm sorry for this thing. Now we're done with it. He says, nope, it's going to take some time to get through this and get over it. Would you guys agree that when you cook, the best things, that, or the things that taste the best take longer to cook most of the time? Eh, maybe? I mean, let's be real. I know some of the men out here have smoked a brisket, yeah? No? Okay. Well, I, I know some have. But it takes a really long time to wake up early in the morning or start it the night before and keep up on it. Some of us aren't blessed with triggers, so we actually have to go out and do it ourselves. I know a lot of you guys think you're great and all because you can just press a button on your trigger and it does it for you. <laughs> Not just kidding. But it takes a long time because you have to check on it. You have to make sure it's, it's staying moist and all these things. But, oh, after those hours upon hours of waiting and waiting and smelling it and you smelling like it because you're surrounded by the smoke and your wife saying, is it going to be done anytime soon? Is it coming? I'm hungry. Can we eat? And you're oh, it's, it's almost there. And then you take it and you carve it and you eat it. And so, so good. Uh, this last week, it was Chelsea's birthday, and so I cooked her uh, stuffed peppers. She loves stuffed peppers, especially when I make them, and they taste great. They're phenomenal, but you know what? It takes a lot of time as well, because you got to, especially if you do it right, you got to chop all the ingredients, and you got to prepare the peppers, and then you got to put the rice in and everything, and make sure the meat and all the stuff is cooking well together in their juices, and to make it just right, and then once you think, oh, I've got all the stuffing made, well, you still got to bake it. And you put it in the oven and you wait, but when it comes out and you just, you look at it and you're, you're so excited, you cut it open and that first bite is wonderful. These things take time to become great, but they're well worth it. Well, well worth it. I do remember having friends over. We were smoking a pot roast and those friends did keep complaining. They're, Why did we choose this? Why didn't we just do hamburgers and hot dogs and all these things? which all the guys had decided we were going to do this pot roast and not hamburgers or hot dogs because men really want to cook something good. But I tell you what, when that food came out and they tasted it and ate it, the complaining stopped. All this to say, I think you guys would agree, there are times when you're impatient. And how easy is it to be impatient with God even? I want to be done with this. You know, Paul even had his thorn in the flesh that he asked multiple times for God to remove it, and it didn't happen. We need to learn to be patient with God and even with our trials. But I think another thing, the last thing we'll talk about for this section, is that simply, we don't want them. <laughs> Part of it's because, again, we're selfish. We want an easy life. We want things to go great. Oh, yes, I love you, Jesus. And life is going to be good until I get to tell you that to your face. And yes. But we know that doesn't happen. There are so many times in Scripture where it tells us that we will have trials. Well, we love Jesus and the world doesn't, so the world's going to hate us. Or as John 16.33 says, that we should take hope because Jesus has overcome the world. But what does he tell them right before? In this world, you will have tribulation. It's going to happen. We don't want it. I'm not saying we should want it or that we should look forward to it. Like, yes, thank you. That was, I'm so glad this trial starting today, God. This is so wonderful. You are just, oh, it's the best. Now, James does say count it all joy when you fall into various trials. 
But I think that joy comes from knowing that when we're at the end, we can look back and see how God has changed us, how he has challenged us, how he has grown us. That doesn't mean you have to go outside jumping for joy that, I'm sick! Woo! It doesn't have to be that way. But when we do start to learn to get rid of these things, the selfishness, being impatient, the expectation of joy, and we really start to understand God's will and God's heart for us, I think that will begin to make it easier. It will begin to help us through these trials. And as we sit and see, man, I don't know what's happening, God. But you do? Oh, that's going to be so, so good. So the next thing we have is the need for trials. We talked about all these problems, especially as us as humans. We don't want them, all these things. Satan wants us to have them. It's a whole other topic we could talk about. But there's a reason for trials. They don't just happen because we have a mean guy up in the sky who says, and today I'm going to press your button here and your button here. Awesome. No, that's not what happens. So James chapter 1, 2 through 4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So again, he does say, count it all joy, which is really hard to do, especially while you're in the middle of that trial. Like, this, this really isn't fun. But we count it all joy because we know that this testing is going to bring in us One of those things we talked about, patience. We're going to begin to rely on God and see his timeline and not ours. We're going to have that steadfastness that's going to take full effect and make us perfect and complete. These trials are there to maybe get rid of a little something here or a little something here to help us become more like our creator. And we're never going to get there while we're here on this earth. I am not perfect. I think you guys know that. No one here is perfect. And even Paul knows he wasn't perfect. We are trying to become more like our creator every day, but we're not going to get there. And then we're going to get to heaven, and he's just going to show us who he is and his greatness, and we won't sin anymore. It'll be fantastic. But that sin, that sin in our lives, in all of our lives, is there. And God wants to just take it away here and there. Or he wants to make us more patient, or more humble, or more loving, or caring. And we'll get to all these things. First Peter 1.16 says, Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Again, we are being made like God every day. Slowly, maybe, sometimes faster. But we're being made more like our Savior, more like our God who is good and loving and kind. You know, it does say, you know, we need to be more like Jesus. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. It doesn't say, follow me, Paul, because I'm awesome. It doesn't say, look at me, look at me, look at me. The same thing here. We don't follow man. We don't follow uh, Pastor Dale. It is great and we love him, but I hope you guys don't follow him so that you can become more like him. I hope you follow him because he has a heart for God and wants to share God with you and to disciple and all these things. We don't follow Pastor Dale to become little Dales. The youth, I really hope you guys don't listen to me on Wednesdays and Sunday mornings and say, oh, yes, I just want to be more like Jordan. Some ways, maybe. No, just kidding. Please, don't, don't do it to be more like me. I hope you, you listen and want to change things because you know that I have a heart for you to see you become more like God. And the things we teach, the things we go through, the hard trials you guys go through, I hope that we can point each other to God constantly. Because man's going to fail. Another hard thing is sometimes the world gets in the way there. They say, well, your happiness should actually look like this. Or we're going to be righteous about this. Why isn't the church being righteous about this? And we have to remember that the world's righteous rampages aren't always God's. So when we're becoming holy, when we're trying to become more like God, and the world's trying to become maybe better or more holy in their eyes, that's not always going to line up. And just because the world and the masses are saying, oh, this is what it should look like, this is, we should just be accepting of everyone in the same way that they are, and that's okay, and there's no reason they can't be that way. Well, we read and see what God says, and that's different. He says, oh, I love those people. 
to death, literally to death. That's why Jesus died. Jesus died for every one of us, including the people we disagree with. He said, I love those people to death, and I would go to the ends of the world for them. But God doesn't leave us the way we are. He wants us to be changed, to become more like him. And you're probably going to have to face that as when the world says, well, why aren't you becoming more like us in this way, the way that we all think? You say, well, that's because my God tells me something different. And my God has more than just 2018 in mind, or 2019, or my social post on Facebook, or whatever. Colossians 2, 3, 3, 2 through 3 says, Set your mind on the things that are above, not the things on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We just have to focus on him. The world's going to throw whatever at us and try to change us, but we say, you know what? That's not what God has for me. He has a bigger and better plan. So this need we have is God challenging us to be more like him every day. Little by little, sometimes a lot by a lot. Hey, come through life with me, he says. Talk with me. Hang out with me, and we're going to bring you to a better place, a bigger plan, a better purpose. And again, we talked about it's not always easy. There's so many tears that happen, and so many days even yelling at God. These things happen, but he says, hey, it's okay. Come rest with me. Today I can tell you just need to rest, so just come hang out and rest. Come rely on me. Come see my strength. And we're all in different places. For some of us, it's every Sunday morning, a trial. Man, I should get my butt up and go to church. Like, ah, oh, but I went to bed a little late. Oh, my pillow's really comfortable, or whatever. I've been in that place before. It's no fun. And there are some times, believe it or not, that I'm just like, oh, I don't want to go teach youth group tonight. No, it happens. There are times where you're just so exhausted or mentally things are going crazy or the child is crying or whatever. You're just, I don't want to do this. But then you realize, yes, you do. I love doing what I do. It's so great hanging out with uh, the youth kids and all the joy that they have and jumping around going crazy or whatever and teaching and going to fishbowl, which is madness. There are so many people there. But there are times where we all have days where we don't want to get up and do what we need to do. Those are little trials. There are physical trials. We have a lot of people in our church who are going through physical trials. Their body's not working the way it's supposed to. And it's been happening for a long time. And for no matter how many times we pray and ask, it's not God's will to heal them at the moment. It doesn't mean he doesn't want to. It doesn't mean he isn't good. It just means he has a different plan. He's taking you through it day by day. We have a lot happening in that sense. And even, of course, we know Pastor Dale going through his trial. And today, he told me on Friday, he knew because how his body was feeling on Friday that he would not have enough energy today to be up here. And that man is going through physical stuff, and he just keeps pushing for it. I love it. He still wants to keep serving and loving on everyone and being there for everyone, and it's so great. So talking of days, you know someone doesn't want to do it. There are days where his body is telling him, you can't do it. But he gets up to come and serve you guys, and it's awesome. Just saying, we should be praying for our pastor constantly. And as these things go on, and as next year comes, and things might get a little trial-y. You know, if you could turn trial into a verb, it's going to get, it's going to be different. But this is the time where our body can come together as brothers and sisters and encourage one another, encourage our pastor, and be a family together. When the things get hard, it isn't time to bounce out and say, I'm done. It's time to surround each other with love and be here for each other. So I encourage you guys, especially with next year coming and all that, but also with the people in your life in general. Someone's hurting, find them. Surround yourself to them and and love on them. Okay, so we're all in different trials. Some of them take a long time. Some of them, it's simply having a Basque student in your house for a month. I know some of you, after week one, you're like, okay, I'm done with this initial, oh, this is great thing, and they're being teenagers, and it's hard. And sometimes they're fighting with your children, or they're just not interacting well, or you feel like you're just not making that connection. And it's a month long. And then you get them back the next month or the next year sometimes and you feel like, did, did you change at all? But we love them. 
we pour into them. And I'll tell you, because Dallas and I just had the opportunity to be over in Spain, what you do having them for a month, though you don't see it while you're having them during that month all the time, but what you do inviting them into your house, eating meals with them, talking with them, hanging out with them, taking them to all the different events and all the things is one of the greatest things I think you could do with your life. Because the opportunities we have been having in Spain are so great. And if you've had a student, I really encourage you to travel over there and go visit your family. Because when you walk into their house, you may have never met the parents, you may have never said a word to the parents, except for, hey, I'm having your child in my house this summer. But you walk in and they are your best friends. You are part of their family. I couldn't tell you how much food I ate. It was really hard. I struggled being in Spain because I ate so much food. It wasn't as easy as you guys think it looked, but it was pretty great. But we got to um, Dallas's family's house the first night, and we're tired, we're exhausted. And like, okay, dinner's in a couple minutes. Oh, okay. Well, here comes, you know, the salad and the bread. Okay, that's good. I like salad. I like bread. Here comes the squid in its own ink different, pretty good. Dallas loved it. Okay, that was the main course. We're maybe a little bit more and we're done. Oh no, here comes the meat, the cow. You know, there's more. And then, oh, dessert. And then second dessert. And then coffee or tea or whatever. And they're just like throwing food because they want to bless you even in their own way because you took their child in. So we become part of the family, but then it leads to conversation. It leads to, they see us living our life in a certain way and they wonder why. It leads to amazing things. Uh, what we do with the Bass students, what God does with the Bass students is amazing. So, this is my plug. I encourage you, if this next coming summer, if you haven't had a student or aren't having a student, pray about it. You got about seven months, pray about it real hard because it's worth it. And then, if you haven't gone over there and you've had a student, I encourage you to try because it's a, the connection we have is so amazing okay i'm done with my little rant on the basque students back to trials <laughs> they're great trials i love them you know sometimes again those trials are long uh while we were over in spain uh one of the other pastors joe was telling a story of how long he prayed for his dad to come to know jesus he said he prayed for around 50 years and when he was saying this, he was kind of like, you know, and I just wonder, like, man, I must not be good at prayer if it took me 50 years until my dad came to know Jesus. And the rest of us are just looking at him like, are you kidding me? You prayed for 50 years. <laughs> like, I hope to have a prayer life like that where I can look back and say, I prayed for something until I saw it come to the end, no matter how long it took. And you're just like, 50 years? That's crazy. But... It was worth it for him in the end, and he saw his dad come to know Jesus. But these trials, guys, they bring us to one place. They bring us to a place where we can say, God, I can't do it, but you can. I need you. Help me. Be there for me. Read Psalms. People, Psalms is full of trial upon trial upon trial. My enemy's behind me. My enemy's after me. They're over there. They're going to attack me. They're going to kill me. Whatever, God, I need your help. You are good, Jesus. I praise you, God. Help me. Psalms is full of cries for help and the needs because of the trials that David is going through. So they bring us to that one place. Though hard, and we don't always want it, it brings us to that place where we can see God, can know him better, and where he gets the glory. And there are going to be days, he knows, where all we can do is tell him how hurt we are, how broken we are, how much we can't do it. He's okay with that. He wants you to talk to him. He wants you to have that conversation. He wants you to tell him your hurts, your sorrows, and your pains. Because when you talk to him, he can then talk back and, and love on you more. Spend that time with him. Okay, now we've talked about the problems, the need. Everyone's all sad and, oh man, these trials are coming. But there's hope in trials, I promise. Psalms 23, 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overfloweth. Guys, this is really cool, I think. God doesn't only know that we're going into trials. 
He doesn't say, hey, tomorrow you're going to be over there. He says, look, you're going to go through this thing, but don't worry. I'm there setting it up right now. That can sound weird. Like, what do you mean, God, you're, you're preparing my trial? That doesn't sound fun. But really, the hope is that we're not going into our trials blind. We're not going into hard things without help. God has already been there and is there waiting for us. He's taken care of it. He's set the table just the right way because he knows how you're going to be affected and he wants to love on you in the best way possible. So he prepares the place for us, but then in the same sense, he says, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. So he prepares the room, he prepares the place, and then he prepares you. This is before the trial has even happened. Before we've come to our enemies, he says, look, I've prepared the place, and now I'm preparing you, and it's going to be okay because I'm there before, I'm there during, and I'm there after, and it's going to be good. Not easy, but it's going to be good. He knows what is going to happen because he loves us. But then there's another thing. Jesus said when he was talking to his disciples, he said, no, it's good for me to leave. Because then I can send the helper, the parakletos, the Holy Spirit. Jesus left because Jesus was stuck in one place with his disciples in Israel. But sending the Holy Spirit allows God to be working in the whole world constantly in such greater ways. And so as we're going through these trials, we have God with us all the time. We have a helper every day, every moment. And I think, you know, it's really easy to kind of look at the Godhead and the Trinity and say, oh yeah, there's God the Father, there's God the Son, and then there's the Holy Spirit too. It's a cool guy, I think, if I know a little about him. But he's so amazing. And he's the thing that we need every day, every moment, coming into our lives, filling us with comfort and joy and helping us and all these things. So I really strongly recommend you guys start to have a good relationship with the Holy Spirit because he's going to be that help for you every day. But then there's more help. We've already brushed on this a little bit. Is There's hope in fellowship. There's hope in the body of Christ. There's this thing, I think, when the world looks at us and they see the love that we have for one another, how much we love Jesus. Oh, you know there's a verse about that, right? The world will know by our love for one another, right? So when people you know are going through trials and you love on them and you're encouraging them, that's so good. Because one, that gives you the chance to be able to just pour into your brother or sister and serve them, but then they just feel the love and everything for it. When we lost Rowan, you guys took care of that. So many people bringing us food and just literally handing us money to help take care of bills and all these things. And I know uh, when people have babies here, we get on a, a food, you know, a meal prep thing. Get on that, do that, because that is a blessing, I'll tell you. I think all the moms would know they don't want to cook. And then the dads are tired too, and we don't want to cook. Bless your brother and sister in that way. Or when someone is sick, there's so many ways we can take care of each other, but the way that we show the world we love Jesus is by loving each other as well. And you guys, I I, I want to encourage you in this because I've seen it happen. You guys do great. But don't, don't get lax on it either. There are people hurting every day, and let's find ways to love on each other. We are giving each other for a reason. I mean, James says to confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. But if you're not talking to one another, you can't have that relationship and you're not going to go deeper with each other. So get with each other and love on each other. 2 Corinthians 1, uh, 3-5 through says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we are, share abundantly and comfort too. The things that God teaches you every day might become something you can share with someone else to comfort them. There's hope in that even in your trials, to know that there's going to be a day when you're done with it and you know the pain it took to go through it where you can turn to someone and say, hey, I've been there. Or you know that person doesn't want to hear anything so they just want the comfort of you being there and so you're just there listening. Whatever it is, we are here for each other for that encouragement, that comfort that God gives us. There's hope, 
knowing that we're not in control. I know you guys want to be in control of your lives. Everyone does. We're human. But we're also sinners, and we're going to take our lives in one way, and God wants to take it in another way. And the more, like the first step, of course, Jesus, be Lord of my life. That's you saying, I'm done with my way. I want it to be God's way. But then during the time, we go a little over here, a little over here, a little over here. But the more we can focus on, God, your way, your goal for my life, your purpose, it's going to be so good. I'm glad I'm not in control. I'm glad that God knows the end because I think God's end is going to be bigger and greater than anything I could imagine. And the more we give to him, the more we give him our life, the more we're going to begin to see that, is that he is going to blow our minds with his plans for our lives. I find comfort in that. I hope you guys do too, knowing that there's an infinite being in control, an infinite being helping you every day through life. You know, I would say the ends don't justify the means. We talked about this on Wednesday with the youth group. They don't. You know, we can't say, we're going to do this thing that's terrible now, but later it'll be okay. I think the only time the ends justify the means is when you're in an omnipotent, eternal, perfect, and loving being named God, then the ends justify the means. Because he is able to look at your time now and say, yeah, you're going to go through something hard right here, but I'm going to get you here. And he says, look, I see all of time and all of history and all these things, and I know the grand scheme of things with your life and the grand scheme of things with the whole world and how I'm going to get glory and how I'm going to come back and how he's going to take care of everything, and he knows. So God is the only person who can say the ends justify the means because he has it all in control. One of my favorite stories recently with this is Joseph. So Joseph, I think you guys know, had trial upon trial upon trial. I mean, he's, other than the fact that his dad loved him the most, so he was probably a little spoiled, we know. He's the youngest at the time. Everyone here who's the youngest knows we really did have it. It was good. My brother and sister got blamed for so many things I did. But his first trial, his brothers hate him, throw him in a pit. Okay, cool. Maybe they'll help me out. Oh, they're helping me out. This is good. Oh, bye, Joseph. Go into, go into slavery. Oh, okay. Well, so Joseph has to go be sold to Potiphar, and eventually he rises up, and God is blessing him, and he's being taken care of, and oh, things are going good, awesome. I'm done with that trial. Thank you, God. Oh, no, just kidding. Here comes Potiphar's wife. Hey, let's do a thing. And Joseph says, no, he bounces out of there as fast as he can. And of course, Potiphar's wife says, oh, but he tried to touch me. He tried to do things, and so he gets thrown in prison. Things were just going good, God. Okay, well, now I'm in prison. Oh, I'm in charge of the prison. This is awesome. Oh, I'm going to interpret these guys' dreams. That's great. Oh, hey, don't forget to tell Pharaoh when, when you go talk to him. Do they remember right away? No, it takes years before the cupbearer's like, there's a guy named Joseph. We should bring him up here. So after being thrown in a pit, put into slavery, thrown in prison, and waiting and waiting and waiting, finally God brings him out, and he interprets Pharaoh's dream, and he becomes second in command in Israel. Read Genesis. It's great. But he's second in command. And you think, oh, awesome. His story, you know, he saves Egypt. He saves the world. Great, Joseph, that was awesome. I'm going to tell you, there's more to Joseph's story than just right there. So when the world started having this famine, Joseph became in control. He saved a certain amount during the seven years of plenty so that they could sell it during the seven years of famine. And so the entire world is coming to Egypt, handing them money, saying, we need food. So the world is at Egypt's mercies. But then Egypt starts to become at Joseph's mercies and, in turn, Pharaoh's. So in chapter 47, verse 14, we see Joseph says that he gathers all the money for the grain. Egypt says, this is everything we have. Take it. We need food. We don't want to die. So he gives them food. All their money is now Pharaoh's. Three verses later, verse 17, all the livestock. Joseph says, you don't have food? Give me your livestock. All the livestock now belongs to Pharaoh. You guys see, Pharaoh's now becoming more and more powerful. And there's a reason for that. And then verse 19, they say, look, we don't have any more money. We don't have any more livestock. What should we give you? He says, give me your land and give me yourselves. So they give him all their land and then sell themselves into slavery or sell themselves to be servants of Pharaoh. 
So Pharaoh now has all the money, all the livestock, all the land, and all the people. God is raising him up. And now Pharaoh becomes powerful. Egypt starts to become a superpower. And that's great. And all the world's coming underneath them. But there's a reason for that. If you guys think, what's the next story in the Bible is the Exodus. So 430 years later, not only has Israel come and multiplied, Egypt has continued to multiply because Joseph set up a tithing system where they had to give 5% to, uh, to Pharaoh every time, or sorry, not 5%, one-fifth to Pharaoh of all their stuff. And so he's been continuing to raise them up. For what purpose? So that God could take his people out, but also God tells us that he hardens Pharaoh's heart. Romans 9, 17 says, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show you power in, show my power in you, that in my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. God used Joseph 430 years before this point to raise up a nation to become great so that 430 years later, God could show he is greater. He is better, he is more powerful, and he is so good. That is amazing. So Joseph couldn't have known when he got thrown in that pit, man, in like 430 years-ish, something good's going to happen. God's going to do great things. He couldn't even see him being coming up higher in Potiphar's house, or so on and so forth. But God had a plan. And one last thing. The ultimate hope, the ultimate thing, is of course Jesus. We know that Jesus went through the ultimate trial. First he became man, Mm, that doesn't sound like fun if you're God, and he became a baby and all these things. He grew up a normal life like us, probably was hungry at times, and as a baby he probably had diapers or some sort of thing to figure that out. He was a human, eternal being, human. But then it came to the point where he's going to die for us. And I think it can be easy to look over the fact that Jesus asked that it not happen. Jesus wanted to die for us because God said, look, there are all my people who I love and I want to die for, and I have this unconditional eternal love because we're filthy sinners, and he says, I still want to die for you. That blows our minds. That is amazing. Why? Because he's God and he is good. So he knows he's going to. He knows and he loves us and he wants to, but he still asks that it doesn't happen. In Matthew 26, 39, it says, In going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So we see here, God, please, if there's another way, let it happen. But your will be done. It's not the only time this happens. A few verses later in 2642, again for the second time he went away and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Jesus has asked twice now, please, if there's any other way, because I'm sure if you were staring at the cross knowing what was going to happen, we would not want it either, but God knows that's the only way. A third time, Matthew 26, 44. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying those same words, asking for this cup to be removed. Luke tells us that he was so tired and so stressed out that first an angel came and had to strengthen him, and then he began to sweat blood. That's how earnestly Jesus was praying for this not to happen, for there to be another way. We've never had to face this trial of looking at a humanity and saying, well, most of them don't even love me, but I'm going to die for them anyways. I'm going to give myself for them. We've never faced that. And not only am I going to die for them, I'm going to die in the most horrific way known to man. This is Jesus' trial right here. Asking God that it doesn't happen. But of course... Philippians 2.8, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. 
not my will but yours be done. And so then he goes through the actual physical trial. He goes through the pain, the emotional things happening, the spiritual warfare, all the things for us. Absolutely, there's hope in that. Hope that Jesus suffered and died so that in eternity we don't have to. Because our our earthly trials, the Bible says, are nothing in comparison to the glory we're going to have in heaven. And so this is so good that he died for us so that we don't have to endure that pain. And coming back to John 16, 33, again, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Because our God is so good. He's taking care of it. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be fun. That's why we have each other. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. That's why we have God. That's why we can go into this world and when things are hard, we can show them that, hey, it's okay. I still have this peace, uncontrollable. We can share the love and the comfort that we have with the world. Because there are people out there hurting too. People out there who are hurting but have no hope because their hope is that I'm going to die and end up in the ground and that's it. So we can share that hope with them of, hey, there's so much more because this God who died for me died for you too. So find your hope in him. No matter what happens, bring it to him. Give it to him. Let him take care of you. He wants to. Let's see what God can do even in our hard times, even when the trials come, even when, of course, we know we can't do it. And I encourage you guys, uh, I think there's prayer afterwards during worship. So if anyone here is going through a trial, go let someone pray for you. Don't just sit and think, oh, I don't, I don't want people to see me go back there. Whether it's physical, emotional, mental, whatever, get up and go have someone pray for you because that's what we're here for is to encourage one another. So if you're going through something, find someone. Maybe it's even someone next to you. Say, hey, can you pray for me? Don't let your fear stop from someone else being able to pour into you and you letting them do so. Let's pray. Father, we love you. You are good. Thank you that you are infinite and you see everything, every moment of history, you know. Every moment of the future, you have planned out and you see what's going to happen and you know what happens, God. You have my life in control. You have everyone's life here. You have a plan. A plan not only to get us through every day, finding you, coming to know you more, being strengthened by you and all these things, but you have a plan that you will be glorified and that in eternity we will get to live in perfection with you to see your holiness, your goodness, your creation as it was meant to be, it will be so good. But God, while we're here on this earth, we pray that you comfort us, that you help us every day. Help us to come to those places where we can say, God, we need you. I need you. Help me. Help us to go to our brothers and sisters and pray with each other and love on one another and encourage one another because this world is hard and the enemy is out to get us, but you, God, are good. God, we worship you. We praise you because you're the only thing worthy of it, the only person who we should be praising. So God, right now, we want to come before you and worship you. We love you, Jesus, and praise you. Amen.